Welcome to episode 104 of the Sports Geek Podcast. On this episode, I'm going to recap our Sporting Future 15, talk about Instagram adverts, and answer a few questions that have come in via the email. Welcome to the Sports Geek Podcast, the podcast built for sports digital and sports business professionals. And now, here's your host to attend sports events to beat jet lag, Sean Callanan. Thanks, DJ Joel. My name is Sean Callanan, and you are listening to the Sports Geek Podcast, either doing that on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or my favorite podcast app, Pocket Casts. Uh, if you use Android, it's pretty much, to me, the only uh, app that you should be using. Um, and the Sports Geek Podcast should be available on all of those platforms. If you're listening to it on other platforms or can't find it on your podcast app of choice, please let me know. Uh, send me an email, sean at sportsgeekhq.com will always get me or send me a tweet at Sean Callanan or at sportsgeek will also find me. Uh, been, a bit of, been on a little bit of a break uh, with the podcast, had a bit of a break in interviews, got a few lined up in the next couple of weeks, but I thought I would bang one out to, to everybody and give you a bit of update of what I've been doing uh, from a speaking point of view and some of the things I've learned over the last couple of weeks as well as answer a few questions uh, that I've had come in via the email. Every now and again, I get people, uh, either students or people working on a specific project with a question or two. They normally just flick them to me via email saying, hey, Sean, can you answer this? And most of the time I'll answer them and I do it in audio format because I find it easier and it's really the format of choice. As you know, I've spoken about that before. Um, So I thought I'd answer a few of those questions because they have been... I guess recurring. Uh, not that I'm going to uh, completely copy the Ask Gary V show, but effectively I'll have an Ask Sports Geek segment in this in this episode. Um, before we get st- uh, before I get started, or well, I am started, so I don't need to say that. Uh, OSF 15, uh, our sporting future, was held up in the Gold Coast uh, just, a week, uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, I presented there. Um, talking about the opportunities for sports and pretty much the attendees were national sporting organisations and state organize, uh, state sports organising bodies, uh, those kinds of things, so less of the, of, of the pro sports base. It was run by the Australian Sports Commission, the, the AOS. So there's a lot of uh, participant uh, sports that are, that are Olympic sports, a lot of real focus on grassroots and, and participants and so they wanted me to sort of talk about the opportunity, opportunities that digital offered and the ability for them to communicate directly to to the grassroots grassroots fans so similar you know similar challenges that uh, pro teams had uh, professional teams had in you know six or seven years ago in starting to find their feet as content producers and finding out what platforms work best for them um, it was pretty much the case um, and I used a few examples um, like the Boston Celtics' early work on Instagram, um, my early work I did with Collingwood on, on Facebook and how we went about using that to better communicate with fans and how they took some of those opportunities to prove ground that that's a platform that's worth working on, it delivers results, it delivers traffic, and then they can build out their teams uh, from there. So it was a good discussion, uh, both uh, had a good time presenting, but also, uh, as you would know if you've met me at a conference, I love the the networking and the conversations that happen around a conference. And um, OSF 15 was 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 no different. So it was good to catch up to have a bit of a different discussion around the challenges of reaching grassroots fans, how they want to engage, how they want to amplify your brand. Um, and how you can leverage crowdsourcing using using things like that I've spoken about before, using things like IFT, um, IFTT, if this then that, um, to to aggregate all your all of your content and find out what your fans fans are doing. Uh, a couple of the speakers that really uh, really impressed me: uh, Russell Howcroft from the Grow and Transfer, uh, his new book, uh, When It's Right to Be Wrong. Um, he had a really interesting take on the you know on the ad game and the sport as a brand um, and his his take on it comes from very much a traditional uh, advertising background and so I'm hoping to catch up with Russell in the next couple of weeks and discuss discuss that with him and sort of maybe argue the point and uh, that digital does have a place uh, that TV is not the answer to everything um, but I've since read his book and it's a very quick and easy read um, uh, when it's right to be wrong on some of his takes on 
I guess idea creation and ideas are nothing. It's all about the execution. Some really good, some really good points in that presentation. Um, and and the other one that I really enjoyed was uh, Marina Go from West Tigers, really taking a digital focus approach to uh, what they do and what and the fact that sport needs to have that focus because that's where that's where fans um, fans are moving. So completely agree with that. So again, thanks to Tim Arnold and Paul Fairweather from the Australian Sports Commission for. Uh, invited me along to our sporting future it was yeah well worth well worth a couple of days up in the up in the Gold Coast um, to sort of chat about yeah chat about all things digital and also see the see the issues that are challenging sports uh, especially those moving into into an Olympic year next year because um, it'll be a big year for them with uh, the 2016 um, Olympics so I don't normally. Uh, push this out and normally this is normally just a attendee type of thing but you're all my podcast listeners so if you want a copy of my uh, slides and presentation from that uh, that conference uh, you can simply go to sportsgeekhq.com slash oc os osf15 for our sporting future so sportsgeek.com sportsgeekhq.com slash OSF15 is where you'll find it and you can put your details in and, and you'll get an email with that presentation. If you did attend and didn't get that, please download it. If you didn't attend, you can still download it. But please, yeah, let me know what you think um, on, on the presentation itself. And again, uh, if you've got any questions, please uh, ping me an email, sean at sportsgeekhq.com. Um, another couple of things. Since my last podcast with uh, Steve Ziff of the Jags, um, been playing around uh, with Instagram adverts. Instagram have recently launched uh, Instagram ads to a wider audience. It's not just an, a play for people who are spending a lot of money on Facebook. Um, it's now available in the self-serve, uh, self-service serve self module through uh, Power Editor and through Business Manager. And again, if you haven't used, if you're not using uh, Business Manager, again, I would stress that you're probably just not using um, you're not doing Facebook ads correctly j- just yet. Um, set, set up Business Manager. It's it's mind blowing, and once you start getting in there and it starts setting things up, uh, don't forget you can get my free uh, business guide to setting up Business Manager by going to sportsgeekhq.com/slash. Funnily enough, Business Manager uh, to download that to download that guide. A couple of things you got to do from a setup point of view, from an Instagram point of view, and again, I'll do this right now just to get it all set up. One is adding your Instagram account to your business manager, adding your Instagram account and tying it to your page. So you can do that in the settings of your Facebook page. Go to your um, settings on your Facebook page. There'll be Instagram and then adding your Instagram account so it's connected. So then when you go to Power Editor, you'll have the ability to run ads to Instagram. At the moment, Facebook is only allowing website clicks campaigns to be targeting uh, Instagram. Um, And what I'm seeing... Uh, initially, um, because it's been you know it's a rush, and I always see when new new platforms come out, it's always a rush of bad marketers that hit the market first. Um, at the moment, if you had a web clicks campaign and you were potentially running ads to Facebook, say to sell tickets or merchandise or or whatever, it has an option to say mobile feed, desktop feed, right hand side, and Instagram. And so by clicking that, your ad will also get pushed to Instagram. My advice at the minute is not to do that. If you're going to run something on Instagram, then just run it on Instagram exclusively because what works on Facebook will not work on Instagram. So there's that, there's that change you've got to make to begin with. So the success that we've had um, has been with the Instagram-only campaigns. The advantage of doing Instagram-only campaign, you can actually then create an audience that's specific to Instagram. So... By that I mean is if you only have Instagram selected, then you can pick your country and it will actually tell you how many Instagram users there are in that country. So example, if you said Instagram users in Australia, it says four and a four, bit over four million. If you said Facebook users in Australia, it's up to 13 and a half million. So automatically it gives you a straight out number of how many people are using Instagram. And then you can do things like target by interest, target by people who are connected to your Facebook page, those kind of things to, to pitch out your pitch out your offer. Now ideally if uh, if I was running an Instagram campaign with the with the same campaign objectives that a Facebook ad would, I would like to run 
a boost or a, you know a page engagement campaign or a post engagement campaign, I should say, because really a lot of Instagram is about getting likes and and tags and shares and people commenting on your on your picture. Um, they don't offer that yet, and I say that yet because it's I think it's on the it's on the path that it makes sense that a lot of the, the objectives that are available in in Facebook will be available in in Instagram. Um, so at the moment it's only web clicks so it allows you to put a little call to action button at the bottom of the photo that allows people to push th- push through whether it's a learn more button buy now button um, sign up button those kind of things um, but my what whether we've had the best success is running a web clicks campaign but really dialing back the call to action and the and the fact that it's an ad um, because really the Instagram audience are very much used to not seeing ads they're very much used to not leaving the environment. Um, they're very much used to not being sold to. Uh, prior to Instagram ads, if you wanted to drive someone to something in particular, a lot of people would do the hack of putting the link in their profile. Hey, guys, here's our latest jump or here's our latest merch. Go, click to the link on our profile to check it out. So the user would have to click on the username, click on the link, and then leave. So it's two clicks to get out. So it was a real uh, cumbersome process. So... To, to stay, I guess, on the spirit of how Instagram is is used, we've been doing ads that are purely about what uh, are about engagement and about what you would normally post on Instagram. Things like, "Hey guys, who's excited about the season at hand? Tag a tag a mate who should come to the game." Those kind of things are things that you would normally put. Who's excited? And just getting you know, double tap if you like the fact that so and so has returned. All of those type of posts that have always worked well, got great engagement. And so we've done those kind of posts in Instagram as an ad um, with a simple book now button. So nothing about buy your tickets now or click the button above, nothing, no, nothing as strong as that, just pure engagement. You know, tag a mate who hasn't been to a game, um, who's excited about the season, really keeping in that, in that vein. And what we've seen is one, not only we're we getting really great engagement on those posts, but we're getting a stack load of clicks, which was completely unexpected for mine. I mean, I was really using it as a bit of a growth strategy and seeing it, how we could sort of see how it work, see how it worked. Um, and we're getting clicks at a tenth the price that we're getting them on Facebook. Now, part of the reason would be um, is that it's still a relatively new playing field. There's not a lot of people in that space, um, so so the clicks are always going to be cheaper at the beginning. So if you're going to experiment with this stuff, I'd experiment now. Um, if you want some help with understanding how to best do that, we've run some. We've been doing some stuff from a ticketing point of view that have been really effective. Also, some from a merchandise point of view that have been terribly effective as well. Um, yeah, please give me a call or or drop me an email. I'm happy to, you know, uh, work through a couple of sessions to to get your system right. Because again, you roll out the wrong ad, you're going to get middling results, and it's going to be hard to continue to push doing further campaigns. So send you know send me an email. Uh, Sean at sportsgeekhq.com if you want to know a little bit more and see how I can potentially help you with that. So yeah, Instagram ads early on, um, really good results. Haven't even tried the sophisticated um, uh, ad types like a carousel or, or pushing video and stuff like that. Really kept it really basic just to see how it works and what we're going to be doing over the next couple of weeks is testing out those different different formats. Um, but for mine, keep it as un ad like as possible for the best results um okay moving into the ask sports geek section um i had a couple of questions from adam and nicole and i wanted to tackle uh some of them so adam asked some stuff for his uh university course uh, around digital marketing and and sports and he asked digital marketing and comms in sport has grown rather than rather substantially in recent years why do you think this is the case um, so my first answer to Adam was to listen to the previous 100 episodes of the Sports Geek podcast because I sort of say that a lot in this in in each episode. But uh, to be a bit more succinct uh, for that question, primarily it's grown because of the the proof and sort of talking about those early examples before with uh, Boston Celtics and and Collingwood and that and the like. The proof has been as the clubs endeavour to uh, reach their fans via their own platforms. Uh, via their own channels, uh, every, the, there's been an increase in both content consumption, data acquisition, uh, merchandise sales, ticket sales, membership, as it's deepened the relationship with the fan. 
Um, and so that's that's why the whole industry has grown. That's why the opportunity has been there for the industry. That's why the opportunity is still there for national sporting organisations or for teams just starting out. Um, if you haven't started in that space and you're thinking about it, start. Once you get started, you will start seeing the justification of the case and, and the reason for, that there is growth in that space. Um, he also asked why, how important is fan engagement in the digital marketing and comm sector for both uh, club and athletes. And fan engagement is a, is a word that I fall in and out of love of because uh, I'm finding it being used more and more and it's becoming a wider and broader word to a, to a, to a certain degree and becoming almost a buzzword. Um, so I'm going to take the... I'm going to be a bit more strict on what fan engagement is in this case. I'm going to say fan engagement in this case is around digital and it is in the communication. It is in the two-way. So for mine, the important bit of responding to fans, answering their questions, responding to questions on Facebook, favouriting tweets, or or loving tweets now that uh, Twitter has no longer got a star, it's got a heart, um, uh, or double tapping on on Instagram photos of fans. I think that is really important because that validates the behaviour of your fans and it shows that you are listening and it's not a one-way broadcast medium because social isn't broadcast. And what made social different is that it is a two-way communication. If you're not participating in that two-way conversation, then you're treating these platforms the same as TV and radio and you will start losing that connection with fans and that that is the secret source. That is why fan engagement, and that's, you know, I'm talking about it as from a community development point of view that's where i think that's uh that's important uh the last question that adam asked and i think he asked about 10 or 12 he's pushing it a little bit but uh one of the questions he did ask was do you think we'll ever see something similar see a sporting version of netflix or something similar in which subscribers can constantly watch sport online if so what would the implications be on the industry um i think when adam asked this question i think it was uh, a couple of weeks ago, and 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 since then, we've seen some movement, at least in the um, in the Australian sports space, and also we've seen a, a you know major NFL game, the Jags game in London, was purchased and streamed by by Yahoo. So Yahoo uh, bought the rights to an NFL game to stream exclusively online, and in Australia, Optus came pretty much out of nowhere um, and purchased the rights to the EPL, the English Premier League. Uh, here in Australia, and so that sort of sort of sent a bit of shockwaves through, I guess, the sports rights sphere. Um, in that one, uh, the EPL rights uh, was a really big property for uh, Fox Sports, um, and so they've now lost those rights. And so there's a little bit of uncertainty on what they're going to do and what assets they need to fill that gap. But also, it comes into this space: um, what will Optus do? How will they serve it up? What what format will they will they do? Now we're seeing a lot of, you know, a lot of cord cutting happening uh, in the US and a lot of streaming only services popping up in different parts of the world. Here in Australia, we've now got you know Netflix, Presto, Stan, multiple uh, streaming services. None of them sport focused, but we've also got sports that are offering their own online online packages: NBA League Pass, uh, you know, NFL, those kind of things. And it's a matter of where TV fits. Um, and what TV wants to do. Um, listening to Ian Patterson uh, from Channel 9 talk about the recent uh, NRL rights, which they, they got the rights for the NRL from a TV point of view, but they also picked up and optioned the digital rights. So I think the digital side of things and the streaming rights and those kind of things and the rights to play on, on devices is, is going to be a strong play. Whether we get down the point of a Netflix subscri- subscriber service um, remains to be seen, um, but there potentially could be that kind of service that aggregates a whole bunch of lower level sports. So again, uh, talking about some of the teams um, and some of the organisations that are at Our Sporting Future, you might see smaller regional leagues or lower level leagues or state championships, that kind of thing being rolled up into a, a subscription based Subscription-based service, so it is a bit of a watch this space. 
Um, I think the main concern um, is a man of subscribers. Um, you know, the model there is there for the for the WWE moving all, moving off pay per view, moving off cable to a nine ninety five a month. Uh, watch everything, watch the whole archive. You know, and the whole ability to to stream and look at archive footage is a big um, is a big opportunity. You know, the NBA, the NFL, uh, the AFL, all of those kind of things could say, hey, we've got all of our footage from every single game prior to this season online. If you want to watch it, this is what it costs. Um, so there is opportunities in that space with archive footage, which is, which is pretty much what Netflix is. Uh, bar three or four new shows, it's archive footage. It's just access to a, an online video store. So whether it's Netflix style, looking at archive footage, or whether it is live streaming, that's the premium product. That's the one that's always going to attract the most money. For mine, that money is never going to be supplanted by TV money. Um, and so it's just a matter of getting that, getting that mix right. But I definitely think there's, a, there's something in that space. Also, Nicole asked, uh, sent me an email. I have not replied, so I'm replying in the, uh, uh, the podcast. And she was asking if, if I had any information around how sports teams and leagues get a Snapchat live story for their match days and events. Um, as an example, you know, college football, um, the NFL, um, the AFL Grand Final was also done in that space, um, and as well as any costs involved. At the moment, it is it is at Snap Choices, Snap Chat's choice to profile specific events, and they then work with those partners to produce that content and help them aggregate that uh, aggregate that content. So. They have done deals in the past with premium products like the NFL, doing a deal with the NFL um, to get them to one to get them on the Snapchat live stories. Um, so I could think that they will continue to go down that path. Um, and which is, you know, the fact that they've gone and done a deal with the NFL puts other leagues in a at least gives them some leverage. Um, as far as well, if you want to, if you want our content on your platform, like our other plat- our other partners, namely TV and radio, who pay to have our content on your platform, they've at least started that th- that that discussion. Whereas every other social network that's popped up has always been, hey, our platform's great. You should you should uh, put your stuff up for free. So the fact that Snapchat have done these deals, knowing that they're a content player, knowing that they're a content platform. With partners like the NFL, it doesn't mean everyone's going to get uh, money or uh, monetizable deals, but if they're at least amenable to doing a uh, revenue share deal, you know, integrating sponsorship, that kind of thing, I think that's a really good place from a sports and a sports team and league point of view uh, to be in. So I'd like to see that model push further and further, and then maybe there could be some potential pushback to maybe other social networks that don't have that model in mind. All right, I've got to wrap this thing up. I've got some uh, meetings and stuff to get onto. Uh, So finish up this uh, podcast. Again, thank you very much for for listening and for the uh, reviews on iTunes. If you could leave one on iTunes, that would be terrific. Uh, Sportsgeekhq.com slash iTunes, and that will take you directly to the iTunes page. It is a bit painful to do it, but I really do do appreciate um, all the reviews. Read them all, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, For those of you who are in Melbourne... Um, We are running another Sports Biz Melb event. I did say at the start of the year I'd run four, and this completes that contract of four. So it is uh, is the case of when you say a goal out loud, it's easier to tackle it. Um, So it'll be November 23 at Honey in South Melbourne. So please go to sportsgeekhq.com slash sportsbizmelb uh, to sign up. It will be a summer of sport focus, as here in Australia we're moving moving into summer. And um, we're going to be talking to some people from cricket, uh, basketball, the NBL, and also the A-League. I'm not going to reveal uh, who it is because I'm still in negotiations and getting people to confirm. Um, But if you are in sports, if you do work in sports in Melbourne, please come along. Um, If you have been to one of these events before, please invite someone new to grow the audience. Uh, Very much appreciative. It's a really good night. Um, Pretty much a big hat tip to Russell Scabetti. These nights have started out um, uh, off his idea of SB night. Um, and really, it's a networking night. Come and meet uh, meet fellow colleagues and uh, and network, find out what everyone's doing, 
and uh, seeing what ideas you can swap and what things you can collaborate on. Um, it's something that uh, is well worthwhile. And please, if you've got a meetup or something like that that's in your part of the world, please let me know. I'm happy to tweet it out and find out if there's anyone in your neck of the woods for that kind of thing. Um, so until next episode, uh, my name is Sean Callanan from Sports Geek, and you've been listening to the Sports Geek Podcast. Like the Sports Geek Podcast? Find us on Facebook.com slash Sports Geek. Check out which teams work with Sports Geek at SportsGeekHQ.com slash clients. Please leave a review on iTunes. Go to SportsGeekHQ.com slash iTunes. Thanks for listening to the Sports Geek Podcast.